the king. Absolutely. Now, we're looking, of course, behind us here, for those watching on television, at the Palace of Westminster, where you have been ensconced for a while. Since 2011, as a Labour peer. Um, must have been fairly extraordinary. We've had the, the joint meeting of the Lords and the Commons, the speakers of both, the King, mm -hmm. and to me as a Brexiteer, that sovereignty, the King in Parliament, that our, is what it was all about, isn't it? Our sovereign King, our sovereign lady is now the sovereign King, and it was remarkable, Nigel, because I love the ancient constitution, the balance of power rather than the separation of powers. I think we've got a stronger democracy than America, for example, or France. I think there's, there's more to it. And what happened was the Speaker of the Lords, Speaker of the Commons, pledged their fidelity to the king but what the king said was he pledged to support democracy and liberty so that was the covenant it was yes. uh, it's, we haven't got a social contract we've got a covenant an institutional covenant and it was remarkable to see it alive the room was yes, alive with it i mean you you know you're an academic and you know well you know don't exaggerate well you are and you lecture on political theory and yeah. things like this and you understand the british constitution better than most you know, for most of us, for most of the country, we've learnt for the first time what a constitutional monarchy is. Well, this is the incredible thing, is that the monarchy underwrites democracy. We've got, it's a paradox, it sounds yeah. wrong, but it yeah. is right. And I think that's the way also to understand Blue Labour, it's a what? Blue, We're going to come to like that. that yeah. But that combination of radical and traditional is the beauty of our constitution. And the key thing is, it's the king in parliament. Yeah. I mean, the reason we had to chop Charles I's head off, was he tried to rule without Parliament? You mentioned it just now. Mm. Why does the Prime Minister have this authority to do a billion here, a mm. billion there? Mm. That's a completely legitimate constitutional point. You've got to work in Parliament. So the tendency is always for the executive, used to be the monarchy, now yep. it's the government, yep. to break the bonds of accountability. And we have to keep them straight. Absolutely. And that's what Parliament's for and what Parliament does. Sometimes well, sometimes perhaps not so well, sometimes... Uh, not too bad, really. I mean, in terms yeah. of the accountability is there. And now we are living in our sovereign state. Yep. We can hold the politicians to account. Yep. They can't hide behind Brussels. No, absolutely. You know, they well, are well, accountable. Well, well, cheers to that as well. Look, <laughs> yeah. Extraordinary, isn't it, on this South Bank? Four days and four nights, over 400,000 people processed. Didn't matter how cold it was, didn't matter how long it took, they wanted to do it. Had the lying in state been for a fortnight, millions would have done it. You know that, yeah. and I know that. And it brought out, I thought, the best of British in every way. Pretty oh, remarkable, it, it wasn't was it? Our, it was our best face, and that's the beauty of this, is that politicians have to do what politicians do, and we are totally unworthy of love. We represent interests, we do mm, deals, mm. but there is a focus with the monarchy where there can be a much more holy things, you know, devotion, duty, obligation, love, sacrifice, and it's real. So we can have a national yes. unity and have and a genuinely politics. what yeah. political theorists call agonistic politics. We can have a politics of real debate, discussion, division, but there is beyond that. Uh, a national unity. I think it was an incredible expression, which you don't find. I mean, I was in Ukraine. I was there for for a month, and every night, you know, sounds bad curfew. But it, but when curfew kicks in, you're in someone's house, you're having a drink, you're talking. Yeah. And when it, they take toasting very seriously, and all I had to say was the Queen. Yeah. Everybody stood up. Yeah, yeah, I mean, everybody and stood up. Sixty percent of the world's population watched the few. I mean, it's unbelievable. And this is extraordinary. Yeah, right, yeah, so yeah. they understand the sanctity of our constitution yeah. much better than we do sometimes. Yeah, it's interesting. Now, you've been sitting for Labour in the House of Lords since 2011, yeah. but you spotted something very early on that I spotted, and it was that working class, patriotic, old Labour, who believed in the family, believed in the Christian principles, the country, or Judeo-Christian principles. The, don't worry, you don't have to the, say that. That's yeah, okay, yeah, but yeah. it's true. Yeah. Was, 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 felt, was, was built on. Uh, that weren't ashamed to call themselves English and British. Mm. That Labour lost complete touch with all of those people. And kind of, ever since you've been in the House of Lords, you've been criticising the party that you've been sitting for. Or is it the urging reform? And it's been reform? mutual. They've been criticising me as well. So, right. you know, that's the way it goes. Because you're, you, know, you come up with this concept of blue Labour. I think maybe we encapsulate this debate best, you know, by talking about your book that's just out, Blue Labour, 
the politics of the common good there it is. by Maurice Glasman. There it is, up on the screen, available, of course, at all good bookshops, no question about that. Explain to us, Blue Labour, and what I'm really interested in is your thinking of this concept of the common good. Yeah, well, those, those are the things. So Labour, I, I'm devoted to my party. I think it's a miracle that only Britain could produce, a party that simultaneously understands that capitalism is a menace. Capitalism tries to turn human beings and nature into commodities. And only by democratic association can we retain our human form. But also Labour, look at Attlee, look at Bevin, look at Peter Shaw. I mean, look at the history of Labour. I love Peter Shaw, by the way. He was magnificent. But all of them are also, you know, Attlee's speech to Labour conference when people brought up constitutional reform, don't mess with it. Mm. Three words. You know, so there's this... But but also, to interrupt for a second, Attlee, I'm told that on his office door, he had Major Attlee. Mm. So proud was he of his service in the trenches in World War I as a Major in the British Army. You see, old Labour was very patriotic, wasn't it? So we weren't a Liberal Party. This is the point. We created our own party, working people created, which was simultaneously conservative and radical. That's the blue Labour. And what's happened is, since we sent so many people to universities and they all become very middle class and they all think that politics is about principles and rights. They don't understand it's about power, it's about how we live together. So the common good says there are different interests. They've got to negotiate and find a common good together. So that's, that's Blue Labour, you know. OK, I mean... On so the... it's very faithful to the, what the party was like, let's say, before 1979. So you're out of date, you're a dinosaur... But this is the other paradox, Nigel, the old is the new. What we saw with the Queen, what we saw, <laughs> what we're seeing every day, if you open your eyes, is that we, reality just is not day by day. It's, there's tradition yeah. and there's things. So it's an expression of real labour. Well, you understand this in a way that very, very few in Westminster, I think, still understand. I, I doubt many of them still get it. Because what I found leading UKIP... There's more than you think. OK. OK, and you must but, find that yeah, privately but, well, Yeah, but we're there. Oh, in private, of course. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. It's just the, the trouble is in public. Then they won't speak. Who's got the guts there? I found, as leader of UKIP, the growth of UKIP began with the Barnsley by-election. It, did. it began in Barnsley. And suddenly UKIP had gone from being considered to be a fringe force outside of European elections, a fringe force, to coming second in a by-election, and we kept on going. And we came very close to winning Labour seats in by-elections. Only the, only the postal vote stopped us from doing it. Yeah. So there were millions of Labour voters going from Labour to UKIP. And then, of course, a lot of them really did lend their votes to Boris Johnson to get the agony of Brexit over. But the evidence is that quite a lot of those voters are now quite disenchanted with everything. And what interests me with the way that you fought within the party... Uh, to get them to reconsider, to, or to reconnect, actually. Reconnect well, to with show, real people outside Islington. To show Islington. love and respect to the people who yeah. created the party. I mean, suddenly they were treated as a kind of unpleasant addition <coughs> to well, the coalition. And you, you got it. And so you are, in many ways, my mortal enemy politically because you understood that you could appeal to that millions who are the decisive force in elections. So the old is the new. Yeah. For years... Working class voters were considered left behind, abandoned, let's have some pity on them. Yeah. But then with Brexit and then with the Conservative victory in 2019, yeah. they're decisive. They are the, the well, force. Well, the Labour Party, the Labour Party took these people for granted. I mean, it put Peter Mandelson into Hartlepool, for goodness sake. It put um, David Miliband into South Germany. These people had hardly ever been to the North East in, in their entire lives. So they were taken for granted and Labour, quite rightly, paid a heck of a price, in my view, and I think yours too. Yeah. Paid a heck of a price for it. So, we've got a, I mean, obviously we've got a new Prime Minister. Uh, she and Kwasi Kwarteng, the Chancellor, are pushing for what they see as free market solutions to get growth. Um, and you might question I do. some and, of that. And so and, th- this will be and you and I would, a ruin. And you and I, if we had an economics debate, would be a very interesting debate. I want that debate. Yeah. Because I, know, no. I think it's vital. Yeah, no, no. We, yeah. I, mean, let, I mean, we should have that debate. Yeah. We can't do it today, but we will have that. Okay. But we, no, we will have that debate. Because uh, I still think, I think, I think the free market still works, but you have to, you have to curb its excesses. But look, but look, and, look, and, 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 you know, but, but look at it, it's just the City of London, the concentration of wealth, 
and the abandonment of the earth. There's got to be political intervention. Well, I think, you see, I would say this to you. I would say that actually free market capitalism at its best is when the little people have a chance to have their say. That doesn't exist. That's, well, it happened. That's a well, it did happen in the 80s. It did happen in the 80s. It's we did see... Behind the back of all of that, you've got the closing of all the building societies, the centralisation of all institutions, the decimation of the assets of the North and the North East. They all flowed to London. And they yeah, all got screwed in. I, I I wouldn't, that's the debate we've yeah, got to have. And I wouldn't disagree with you on much of this, you know, emotionally. I think, I think the common good concept, I quite like that concept, is Welcome. how we get to it. Welcome. And, and, we'll, and we'll have a big debate. But my question to you is, can the Labour Party, can it rediscover that connection with these voters in, you know, whether it's in Dudley or, you know, Bishop Auckland or wherever it may, because they've got to win those seats back to we win. Do, we do. Right, and, that, and that's, that's the thing. So what we have is our tradition. So it's, it's whether Labour can understand itself as a historic force mm -hmm. that defends human beings against these inhuman forces yeah. that just say, no, the factory is closed, no, you, the, you know, you've got to work in a call centre. You know, it's got to be able to reconnect with those places and it's got to be able to listen and respect the people. Now, that, obviously, Brexit was a massive rupture mm -hmm. because... Ultimately, it said, no, we're not, we're not listening to that. We don't yeah. want to strengthen the democracy. We don't want the accountability. We just want mm. to work within these constraints. So it's a huge journey back yeah. to being itself. Because if you think of Labour, just think of yourself in the 60s, 70s, what would you say it stood for? You say, well, more state intervention in the economy, yeah. Yeah. a bigger role for the working class, yeah. and the places that they live. That's the moment now. And it, stood, and it stood for Queen and Country. Always. No question but about always. that. It's those people, the Tommy Atkins, Patriots, absolutely. Final quick thought. Can Keir Starmer stand up and sing God Save the Queen and folk out there believe that he means it? Well, Nigel, it's God Save the King. So I apologise. You've, you've, you've got to adapt. Got to adapt. You've got to get, got to you've got to get, you've got to get with the programme. Can he do it? He did it. I mean, when we Never. had that Is assembly... Is it believable? Is it believable? Oh, I think singing God Save the Queen, King is completely... You did it. We all did it. <laughs> it was a strange experience, but he, he, he can do that. It's, it's whether he can fully accept the democratic possibilities for Labour okay. opened up by Brexit. That's the big question, because now we're free. And if you want to have state intervention, we're not bound by Lisbon and Absolutely. Muscat. And that's the whole deal. I can know. we be a sovereign... Can Labour be the force for democratic sovereignty? It. That's the issue. Boris Glasman, thank you very much indeed for joining me on Talking Pines. Terrific.